Hello, everyone. We're joined today by Rohit Vazwani. Hi, Rohit. Hi, Josh. And Rohit is the Client Portfolio Manager at Omnis Investments. Um, Rohit, why don't you briefly just tell us a bit about Omnis for those of the those of the listeners who haven't heard of it? Sure. Um, so, so Omnis is the the asset management house of the the Open Work Partnership, which is a a, a, a UK based advisor network, which the Orchard Practice is, is a member of. Um, and we are, we're an independent asset manager. We're regulated directly by by the FCA, so we are responsible for all, all our all our funds. We've got about nine billion in assets under management, so that makes us one of the top fifty UK asset managers in in, in the UK. And we we cover funds uh, across the entire spectrum, so anything from kind of UK equities over to emerging markets, fixed income, alternatives. So we kind of cover what we think is a broad range of of asset classes that, when you then blend them into a portfolio, gives clients a, a diversified portfolio. Lovely, thank you. And so for for a quick background on. Rohit. So Rohit spent about seven years working at Fidelity. He then had a couple of years at Platform before a brief stint. Well, not brief stint, it was about four years, wasn't it? At Last mm-hmm. Word That's right. Media. And then I think you've been with on this, is it about six months now? Not not quite. Just just gone past the five month mark. So it's so not quite six months. I'm still using so you, the, the, the new boy card internally. So you've passed your probation though? Have you... Yeah. Or, or as my boss put it, the honeymoon period is over. <laughs> so what... Is it- what does a client portfolio manager actually do? So, so I sit within the, the investment team. So I report directly into the, the, the chief investment officer. And, and my role is very much to take what the investment team are doing uh, and make sense of it and then translate it into non-jargon lingo uh, and then be able to explain what's going on in the portfolios and the funds to, to, to advisors, but also to, to clients and, and just make it a little bit easier access, if you like. Because I think as, as an industry, we're, we're so caught up in talking in, in jargon and using Excel spreadsheets and just talking, uh, you know, in a, in a language that not everyone understands. And so my role is to take that and try and make it more accessible to, to our clients. Sounds good. So I've got a slight vested interest in this because as well as sort of being a friend of Josh's, he, he also manages some of my money or he's also my advisor. So some of my wealth is with Omnis funds. So I'm quite right. interested to know how, how things are going. But I mean, can you tell us a bit more about the sort of strategy, like how you invest, your, your, the kind of approach? Yeah, and, and, and our approach is slightly different to the average asset manager because what we do is we, we are what we call ourselves the authorised corporate director. So there's the first bit of lingo that we use in the yeah. industry. Um, in essence, what it is, is that we're fully responsible for all our funds and, and we've, uh, over the years, evolved that fund range. So you know, we used to have one UK fund and now we have four different ones. And so we've evolved that and, and we have we set the parameters of the fund we decide what to invest in we decide what the, what the manager can and can't do we do all the reporting etc but what we then do is we go to the market and we find who we believe is the best manager to actually make those investment decisions within the parameters that we've set so so we don't believe that any single asset management company can be the best at every single thing so what we do for our clients is we go and find who we believe is the best manager and we appoint them and then we work with them on an ongoing basis. Okay, so why are you investing here? Uh, what, what decisions are you making? Is your process working, et cetera? And, and, and that has two benefits. One is uh, you don't have to go and research the market as an advisor or a client. You know that we are, we are doing that. And the second one is we monitor what we do on an ongoing basis and what, and what the managers are doing. And what that means, if, if a manager decides to, to leave the organization or they're, they're not quite performing the way we would like them to, their style isn't what we, we thought it would be, we can go in and make a change. So we can say, actually, you're no longer appropriate for this manager. And we have we found a different manager who's, who's more appropriate to run that fund. And we'll bring them in to do that. And you as a client don't need to do anything because we are doing that for you. So you don't need to worry about whether your fund is, is doing what it's meant to be doing because we're doing that for you. And it also means, you know, in the example I gave where a manager retires, for example, if you were in their fund and, and, and they retired, you might want to then decide to leave that fund and move to somewhere else. So you have to go and switch. That means you're, you've got some time out of the market. You, you might have some capital gains, tax issues, etc. We do it all within the fund structure. So therefore, you don't have to worry about, about any of that. And I think that's the real value add of what you get with, with Omnis, that ongoing governance uh, within the funds. And just to introduce some more jargon, or hopefully, won't, are the, the managers you're choosing, are they active managers or are you looking at passive funds as well? Yeah, no, so we, we only work with active managers and, and okay. we're firm believers that in the long term, active managers should be adding alpha and delivering value for, for clients. 
And I think that's what we want to focus on today, isn't it, Mark? So to understand a bit more about active investing and touch on passive investing as well. And, and we'll, we'll see where we, uh, where we get to. So do you want to explain what active investing is? And also you use the word alpha. So maybe explain what that is as well. Sure. Yeah. So, so let, I mean, I think it's always worth, and I know you've done it in, in one of your previous episodes, it's always worth thinking about why do we invest in funds full stop? So if, if I say, for example, I've got a million pounds in my pocket, um, I'd, be, I'd be very rich, obviously. And we, Fantastic. We, we might, big we might not be, we might not be having uh, this conversation. But if we, you're too had, big for us, Rohit. Is that what you oh, say? <laughs> not sure about that. <laughs> um, but say I have a million pounds, and I and and I just know because I've been speaking to people that I should be investing my money so that it grows over, over time. Um, but I don't know what to invest in uh, because I I'm not, I'm not in the industry and I have no no knowledge. So I might just decide and say, well, I'm with Vodafone. I like Vodafone as a mobile network. I'm just going to go buy shares in, 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 in Vodafone. Um, now, every time I want to buy a, a fund, a, a stock, sorry, you've got to pay a transaction charge. And I had a look and roughly you're looking at about £12 every time you buy or sell uh, some shares. So I'm paying £12 to buy it. And when I want my money back, I'll pay another £12. But then the, the question is, what happens if Vodafone goes bust? I've lost all my money. So my million pound is, is gone. So then I might decide, oh, well, I'll invest in, in Vodafone and I'll invest in O2 because if Vodafone goes bust, then hopefully everyone will migrate to O2 and they'll, and they'll do that. So now I'm buying two stocks. So that £12 has become £24. So, so I'm, I'm paying more, more, more in, in charges. Now, imagine I don't have a million pounds and I only have a thousand pounds or I only have a hundred pounds a month to, to save. That £24 is going to really weigh on, on, on my returns. And then what happens if instead of the example that I gave was around mobile phones, but what happens if I was investing in, in airlines and I had invested in Ryanair and EasyJet to hedge, hedge my investments um, and then COVID happens and I'm only exposed to the travel industry and, and, they, and they went through, through quite, quite a torrid time. So then I might say, OK, instead of buying just airlines, I'll buy supermarkets as well. And, and because if people aren't traveling, they'll go spend more money in the supermarket. And then I'll buy Waitrose and Aldi, opposite ends of the spectrum. And suddenly now I have four stocks. So that £24 is now £100 that I'm spending. And it's re really eating into my returns. So the idea of a fund is that you, you get, you know, you get your £1,000, Josh, you get your £1,000, Mark, you get mine. We your million, together. so we're the paupers. <laughs> yeah, so your thousand, your thousand and my million. Uh, we put them together and then um, and then we then say, well, what should we be investing in? So, yeah, we'll, we'll share the costs of all of buying this, but what should we be investing in? And that's where you appoint an active manager. So you go and find a manager who should say, where should you invest in? Should you invest in EasyJet or Ryanair? And what an active manager will do is they won't just gauge it on whether they traveled with EasyJet last or not. They'll look at, you know, what market share does the company have? What are their accounts look like? What are their future prospects? They'll go and meet the management team. They'll look at the competition. They'll look at regulation. So they'll look at all of these and make an informed decision as to whether I want to invest in EasyJet or Ryanair. And then they'll also say, well, actually, from a risk perspective, I want to invest across different industries. So not just airlines. I want to invest in supermarkets and I want to invest in, in clean energy and, or whatever, okay. whatever the, the remit is. So, two, so just to, to jump in there, so two benefits you've, you've highlighted there. Diversification, so investing yep. in different sectors, different funds, and also fees. So the costs are shared among the different people rather than you having to pay them all yourself. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then... So, the, Go, go on, go on. So, but in contrast with a passive fund, you would um, invest in a portfolio that just tracks an index like the FTSE All Share or something. What's the difference with an active manager choosing all those stocks and a passive fund be spreading money in, in all of them? Yeah, so look, the, it's, it's spot on there. And a the passive fund has the same principles. You're diversifying and you are pooling everyone's money together to kind of share the costs. But rather than a, than a, a, a manager looking at accounts and, and meeting the management to decide whether to invest in a company or not, it just tracks an index. So if you take the FTSE 100, for example, the, the top four holdings are Unilever, AstraZeneca, Diageo and Vodafone. So, so big names, uh, you know, Unilever, for example, has got 5.7% in the FTSE 100. So if you were buying a FTSE 100 track, you would have five percent, five point seven percent of your money invested in that in, in that in, in Unilever, regardless of whether Unilever is a good business or not a good business, because that that is slightly relevant. And and the benefit of that is it's it's less cost cost intensive. So a manager is, who's doing all this research as a big analyst team is spending a lot of time an, an, analyzing. They're going to charge a fee, and that's quite costly. 
Whereas in the passive fund, well, you're not doing any of that analysis, you're just tracking an index. It's, it's a lot cheaper. The, the, the drawback of, of a passive fund is, is kind of the unintended consequences, if you like. So if you look at the, the US, so the S&P 500 is the kind of 500 largest companies in, in, in the US. If you track the S&P 500, 21% of your, of your uh, assets are held in the five biggest stocks. And guess what? They are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and Google. So you're exposed 20% to technology and five stocks. And by the way, there's probably a lot more technology in there, but just, just looking at the top five. And that, that would be great in a year like last year, where you know that's what led the market is technology. But is that what you want, is just to be invested in technology? You probably want a bit more diversification. And you're not actively deciding that I want to go into technology. It's just kind of a byproduct of going down the passive route. And that's partly the reason why we, we prefer active, because we don't want to take those unintended risks. So there's all, there's a lot of um, noise in the press, marks in the press, but there's a lot of noise in it sometimes about how active funds sometimes are, I think they turn their users like closet trackers or closet passive funds where they just end up doing the same. I don't know whether you've got any information to hand because I didn't sort of prep you on this, but you, you spoke about sort of the top five uh, companies in the FTSE or in the S&P 500. Are you able to give us a bit of a comparison maybe in a Omnis UK equity fund or an Omnis US equity fund to see if there is a difference between the, the top five? Yes, I probably can if you give me a minute because I can just pull it up. Uh, Fantastic. <laughs> good, good question. And I think, you know, part of what we do at Omnis is making sure that our funds aren't closet trackers, that, you know, if we are charging a fee for them, that we are actually delivering what we, what we want them to be. Um, so if I, if I look, for example, at the, the, I don't know, our income and growth fund, uh, which, which is a UK uh, or, you know, kind of all cap fund, if you like, the top five, the top four holdings are, you know, GlaxoSmithKline, Aviva, BP and Kingfisher. So none okay. of the set of the completely top different. five. Yeah, completely different. And look, they probably have exposure to some of the names that we, that, that I just mentioned in the, in the index, but just in a, in a different exposure level. Uh, and, and that's the point. It's not about whether you own a name or not only. It's about how much do you want to own of them and therefore how much overall risk do you have. So I'm not saying in the S&P, for example, example that uh, you don't want to have exposure to Amazon, for example. You just might not want to have 20% of your of your money in the top five stocks. Okay. And so do active funds always outperform? No, no. And, and there's two bits to, to, to that. Is One is just because you're an active manager doesn't mean you're any good. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, there are pretty, there, there's a good array of, of bad active managers there. Uh, you know, I, I tend to call them the dog funds, you know, the ones who are consistently outperforming. So, so I think firstly, you need to find who are the good active managers and who, who, who are the bad ones. And then the second bit is, well, even an, a good active manager will, will go through periods of, of underperformance. Um, you know, when we speak to the investment managers that we work with, we try and understand, understand their process. And part of that is to try and understand when they try, when, when are they going to outperform? Because they're not going to do it at all times. And, and how much of that outperformance that they've delivered is through skill or through luck. And I think that, you know, we, 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 you need to distinguish the, the, the two out of that. And is the and, skill bit, is that what you call alpha? Well, so the, the alpha is the output of the skill. So the alpha is what the, the, the difference in performance from an active fund versus the benchmark. That's what we call alpha. So the FTSE 100 gave you uh, 10% and the active fund gave you 12%, your alpha is 2%. So that's how we calculate alpha. But that 2%, we want to make sure is coming through skill, not just because they got, they got lucky. How do, you know, how do you know that? How do you identify the skill? And, and we, we, we use something called hit rates. So we go back and look at their portfolio over the last five, 10 years. And, they, and we look at how often are they getting names right versus how often they're getting them wrong. Because not everyone is going to get every single investment they do 100% correct all the time. The idea is you want to get them right more often than you get them wrong. And that when you get them right, you, you, your alpha, your positive alpha is higher than when you get it, than what you lose when you get it wrong, if, if that makes sense. And so that's what we, we, we try and do. And then we, and then we test it. So if we know that a manager is, you know, what they do is what we call value, they invest in value stocks. So those are stocks that, where the shares are trading cheaper than what the value of the company is, then we know we can go back and say, well, during this period, bad value outperforms. Did that, did, would this strategy have outperformed? Uh, or would they would have underperformed, underperformed did this strategy have outperformed? And, and I think that's really important because what we want to know is when is a manager likely to underperform? 
so that when they are uh, running our, our Omnis funds, if they go through a period of underperformance, the question we ask is, is this expected? If it is, fine. If it's not expected, then something's not right. And that's where we kind of intervene. And how, how long should a manager be given to, to get things right? So, so it depends on, on, on the funds. So within Omnis, we think about uh, performance and, and funds here and our funds in, in, on a five-year time horizon. And it's what we tell our clients that, you know, unless you, you're willing to park your money for five years, you shouldn't be investing in, in the stock market. Um, so that's the, the overall horizon. In the short term, if they're underperforming, again, if we understand why and it's expected, that's not a bad thing, as long as that five-year horizon is, is, still on, is, is still at bay. If we, uh, if their process and style means that they should be outperforming when they're underperforming, that, that that's a problem we, we try and intervene at that point. So, because one of the, I guess, most high-profile, poor-performing fund managers recently has, has been Neil Woodford. He's kind of fallen from uh, being seen as a fund supremo or star fund manager, at least in the press, to seeing his equity income fund liquidated, essentially. Um, and I don't know if you have views of what went wrong there or... Do you think that, do you think, um, well, what, what do you think went wrong there? That's my question, I guess. And, and look, I think we could have a whole episode on, on Woodford because there, there are so many nuances on that. And, you know, I think uh, Woodford obviously built his name around being a good manager and, and, and obviously delivered, but he had a certain style and, and, and that style did go out of favour for, for quite a few years. So there's, that, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is around, um, the, the issue he had was around how much was he invested in stocks that were not liquid? And, and, and again, uh, let me let me kind of jargon bust there because what we mean by liquid is, can you sell the shares of that company quickly? Is, this, is there a buyer if you, if you need to? Uh, so, I mean, some of the names he invested in were just, but were either unquoted, so you couldn't, you, you'd have to kind of go and find a buyer rather than just sell it in the market, or were very liquid, so there weren't, there weren't many buyers for them. That's a challenge because in a product like his, which is kind of client, aimed at the end client who might want to have their money in and out on a daily basis if suddenly everybody wants their money back and he's not able to sell those shares fast enough guess what he can't give the money back and that's kind of the the, the beginning and then you, you enter a bit of a, of a roller coaster ride um I, I don't have a strong view on, as to whether what the names in his portfolio were any good or not uh, you know, i think i leave that to, to to the professionals but what i think is um it was just the wrong structure, possibly, in terms of him going down the, the illiquid area of, of, of the market for, for, for the end investor. Uh, whereas maybe for a different type of, of organisation, different type of clients, that might might have been okay. And I think that's kind of what, what went wrong. And he did run some Omnis funds for a while, didn't he? Obviously not, but not with the unquoted stuff. No, so he he actually ran the the income and growth that I just briefly mentioned not about, and um, and yeah, he never breached any of our kind of unquoted illiquid parameters. So as I said, we set the parameters, and he never breached any of those, and we obviously monitor on that. Um, there is obviously going to be a contagion effect, right? Because some of the names that he held, we held in the income and growth, he held in in his main fund, and so when that wraps up, there is a contagion effect. And so, so kind of we did, we, you know, that money, that, that fund did underperform for, for a while, but we, we transitioned that fund over to Jupiter and, and that fund is, is, is doing amazingly, actually. It's recovered really well in, in, in the last kind of two years since, since Jupiter took over, particularly in the, in the last year. Um, so look, you're not always going to get it right. And I think that's, that's always the, that, that's a key message. Active managers, management isn't about getting every single call 100% right all of the time. It's about making sure that you're right more often than you are wrong. Why would he, given his, he had a long track record of at Invesco, why would he not have been given more time with Omnis to see if he could turn it around? Oh, well, I think he ran the, he ran the fund for, for quite a while, but I think when we, when, when, when everything went on and, and his main fund got, got kind of suspended, that was a time when we said, well, actually, I think we just need to, we just need to kind of plan in terms of what we're going to do with this fund. Uh, we had been, we had been watching, uh, Jupiter for a while and we, we always liked them and it just felt like a natural thing to do and that's exactly what we should be doing is, is making sure that we are monitoring this on an ongoing basis and um, there are funds in our stable that have underperformed in the last kind of three years that we haven't gotten traded because actually we do expect them to underperform and actually we think that their style is turning around and, and we'll, we'll see a, a, a good future for them in the next few years um, but in that case that wasn't that, that we didn't feel comfortable at the time. 
One of the um, most famous uh, investors of all time is is Warren Buffett, the, the sage of Omaha, as they like to call him, who was over sort of a 50, 60 year period, delivered fantastic returns. And he's a, an active investor. But interestingly, his, he, he is rumored to have said that when he dies and his wife inherits everything, he says she should put it all in passive in, in tracker funds. What would you make of that? I mean, there's there's probably two answers to that. So I guess a skeptical in me is um, if this is probably a case of do as I say and not as I do. Right? If you look at kind of his company, Berkshire Hathaway, about less than 1% of his equities are in index funds. So, you know, he's, he's not, as you said, he's an, he's an active investor and, you know, he's, a, he's an avid follower of Benjamin Graham, who's known as the father of, of value investing. And um, there was a speech that Buffett did in the 80s, which, which kind of still resonates today, which is go and search for discrepancies between the value of a business and the price of the shares. And that's what you want to have. That, that's how an active manager should, should, should make money. Um, so, so on one hand, I say, like, well, you know, why is he saying one thing while he's doing the other? So there, there's a bit of skeptical in, skeptical, skeptical in, in me on that. But then when you, when you think about it a little bit more, I think one of the things I mentioned earlier is it's quite hard to find a good active manager versus a bad active manager. And it requires a lot of, it's quite resource intensive. So that's what all we do at Omnis. You know, that, that's our sole job is to go and find good active managers. Can the average investor go and do that on an ongoing basis? Probably not. And I think that's where he's coming at it. That, you know, unless you can find a really good active manager, you know, in his eyes, he's probably the best active manager, then just, just, just get your money invested. Because that's the most important thing is to try and get people invested into the market. Yep. And then kind of the active passive debate comes, comes secondary to that. Okay, so 2020 was obviously an interesting year with the the pandemic. I'm not going to dwell too much on on that, but um, when markets are going down, so if you're in a passive fund or a tracker fund, then the value of your investments are going down. That's the time when you would expect the active managers to to really show their their worth. How how did that go with the the Omnis funds over that period? Um, so the Omnis funds did I mean, a, a mixed bag across the board, and you know I, I could pick numbers here. There's you know our UK old companies underperformed, but then our UK smaller companies outperformed. And the same in the US, our our larger companies funds underperformed because we didn't have that 20% exposure to those five big names. But then our smaller companies outperformed, and so the, the but the scale is 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 quite different. So uh, I think the US fund, the large companies underperformed by five percent. But it still delivered, you know, a positive return. So you're still looking at 10% returns roughly, whereas the smaller companies uh, uh, fund outperformed by something like 10%. So it's that scale. It's, it's about not about whether you underperform or outperform. It's what what scale are we talking about? But I think the the really important thing is nobody should be buying any single one of these funds individually. Everybody should be investing in a diversified portfolio. And Josh, this is probably what you're telling your clients is you need to invest in a well-diversified portfolio in a, in, a, in a mix of asset classes. And that mix will be dependent on what your risk profile is, what your attitude to risk is. You know, I often think of risk as, as, as a roller coaster. Some people love roller coasters, some people hate it. But also some people can't take can't go on a roller coaster because they have a heart problem. So it's, uh, you know, so how much risk are you willing to take and how much risk can you take? And then you come up with an asset allocation. And when I look at all the portfolios that are available to clients that have on this funds, and, and there's various out there, um, every single one of them outperformed their benchmark equivalent over, over, over in, in 2020. And and we shouldn't be looking at a single year, but you know, because you asked me, I'm, I'm putting it into context. So every single one outperformed. What we should be looking at is over five years. Is that the case? And absolutely, that is still the case. I this, think the single year comparison is interesting because, as Josh said, last year should have been the time when active managers showed their skills because if i look at my i've got a portfolio of etfs with uh robo advisor with with nutmeg not an advisor no ro robo uh, platform fund picking, fund picking. and us. yeah and and that's up um 40 over the past year so i would expect but i would understand to look at my active funds and i'd expect them to, to do better and, and again, it depends on, on, on the year. So if you look at 2020, I think to a certain extent, active manage, it, was a, it was a good year for active managers, but it was a, almost a year of, of two. So you had the first quarter and then you had the rest of the year in terms of so very different. And what happened in the last kind of the, the nine months from April onwards is um, every, everything was led by the, the, the tech 
So if, if you're a passive player, you're actually going to do really well because you, you've got a heavy exposure to them because you're just tracking an index. Whereas most active managers, or some active managers, I should say, won't have had that. So for, that's why, for example, our US, uh, our US large cap fund would put it on the form. I actually think the better year for active managers to show what they're worth is this year because we're already seeing a bit more of a discrepancy in terms of the better businesses outperforming, those that are doing well of kind of lockdowns, unwinding, unwinding etc. Whereas last year, kind of technology just let the pack and everything was going in the, in the same direction. So it's hard for an active manager, I think, in, in that environment to try and pick somebody who's going to do better than the rest of the, or the, rest of the, the, the market. I think this year is just okay. going to be more, it's probably better. I am, um, when I meet with my clients and we have our annual planning meetings, we very rarely talk about performance um, for the reason we're saying you can pick any time period, a six month period, a 12 month or three years to flatter or deceive, depending on what you want to show. So we tend to not focus on investment performance and try and focus on uh, the bigger picture. So are my funds, is my money going to help me achieve the things I want to achieve in life? I think that's what financial planning is all about. Um, but you obviously need to have this behind the scenes to, to make it all work. And so, Mark, you, you sort of said something was up 40% over the last year. But what would be more interesting is to, is to give us the 12 months before then, because mm -hmm. you would expect things. When we're having meetings with clients this month, everyone's performance is showing fantastic because a year ago, the world was in the doldrums. Yeah. So I don't know if you've got on your little app there what happened the year before. If it was up 40% the year before, we're all moving over to that. <laughs> oh, you want me to do that now? Well done. No, two weeks' time. In two weeks' time? No, do it now. <laughs> <laughs> I need a minute. Well done. Well, whilst you're uh, looking for that, I'll ask Rohit another, another question. There's been a lot over the last year or two years with the, the pandemic. Um, of these sort of influencers that you see now, people who have got a an app going online, doing a couple of videos saying, I recommend you buying this because I've put money in it and I've turned my 75p pocket money into six grand or my 10 grand into 10 million. What are your thoughts about about this? It's it's really interesting because I'm, I'm, firstly, I think, I think it's a good thing that younger generations are taking an interest in kind of money. Um, I mean, when I joined the industry uh, way too many years ago in 2007, um, I didn't even know what an ISA was. Um, so, so I think it's, it's, it's good that people are, are taking an, 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 interest in, an interest in it. But I'd say when you're trading speculatively in, in stocks, it's not any different to gambling. And we all know what, the, what issues you get when, when, when you get into, into gambling. And, you know, the obvious one to talk about was GameStop, when you know, that, that kind of hit the news earlier this year. Um, you had investors on, on, the, on the Reddit forums just saying these stocks are going to the moon. Um, firstly, that's kind of borderline market manipulation because you're just saying things are going to happen and, 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 and that's a criminal offence. You know, you're, you're kind of driving the stock up to then dump it so that you've, you've made a profit. You know? So, so the, that, that's the first thing is, you know, be really careful going down that red because, you know, at some point uh, somebody's going to say, well, you're, you're manipulating the market because if a big institution was doing something like that, they'd be in real trouble uh, for it. Um, and then the second, the second part of that is that you're buying these shares based on what we call the greater fool theory. So you buy it, you drive the price up, you ride it to the moon, and then you keep posting about it, and then you sell it to a greater fool who thinks they can take it from the moon down over to Mars. Now, what's to say that you're not that greatest fool? That you bought it at the moon and you can't Talking drive it to Mars. Talking to you, by the way, not me. <laughs> uh, but you bought it at the moon and you can't drive it to Mars and you've got to ride it all the way back down to Earth. You don't know when that chain's going to finish in terms of that, that, that great fall. And, and, and we saw that this year, and I think that's that's going to have some some big repercussions in terms of people wanting to get involved. If they were on that downward trajectory and they've lost their deposit to the house or they've, they've lost kind of, a, a, you know, pre-retirement money, etc., they're going to lose faith in, this, in the investment system. So I think you just need to be really careful in terms of the kind of fads if you like in, uh, yeah and i think people need to realize as well um that it's not that they are not a professionally trained stock manager advisor whatever you want to call and, that, and that's not me saying everyone needs to see an advisor but you would hope that you get better information from someone who's professionally qualified and knows what they're talking about absolutely all of these influencers uh, you know, anyone talking about this they're not regulated 
So there's the, 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 they're not on, on, on the hook if something goes wrong. You are. And, and so you just need to be really careful with that. That's the whole point that we have. A, we, we, we work in, in a very highly regulated industry is to protect the, the, the consumer. Going off what a TikTok video said to do is not going to give you any form of, of, of protection. Um, and and I, I often say this, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And, and I think that if, if you've got that in your back of your mind, then that, that should help in terms of thinking about uh, investing. And then look, the, the final thing is, what, you know, we live in a world of instant gratification, right? So we, we, if, we, if, if my kids want to watch something, they know how to turn Netflix on and watch it straight away. When we were growing up, we had when to- When I was a lad, I just have four channels. <laughs> and we had to wait. And if we missed the six o'clock show, we had, we, that, that was it. We, we, you know, if we were lucky, we had a VHS to go and record it and watch it later, but most of us didn't. Um, and so we live in that instant gratification period at the moment. So when they see things like uh, quick cash, that's that's what they get enticed by. And I think what we need to do as an industry and as a society is stop thinking about now and think about the long term, think about retirement. And and, I, and I'd say, you know, young people need to look at kind of what are their parents doing? What are their grandparents doing in terms of their retirement plans? And, and how can you be better than them? Um, you know, if you start saving for retirement, you know, when you start working at the age of 25, You've got to put £350 a month away to get a 30 grand income in retirement. If you wait till you're 45 and it suddenly hits you that you have to pay for retirement, you've got to put over £1,100 away. That's a lot harder to put £1,100 a month away. It's much harder than putting £300 away at, at the start of your career. Oh, and by the way, the government helps with that in terms of kind of tax, tax, you know, tax it being more tax efficient and your employer is contributing as well. So actually you're not having to put 300 pounds, it's much less what you're having to put. I and think, I think we're ready to convert you, Rohit. I think we're ready to move you over to this side of the fence for advice and planning. But can, how, how much of it though is it, is it an industry issue? Because a lot of these influencers, or well, some of them may say, oh, I, I have time to go online and look at um, research reports and analyst reports and I can't afford a financial advisor so I've worked out a way to do it myself and I want to share my knowledge is it too easy to blame them and to, to say they shouldn't be doing this or should it be should the industry be saying well we should be looking at better ways to communicate but I think that's a bit different because if they're sharing their sharing knowledge is different to to sort of saying right buy this stock it's it's going to hit the thing if you if you give a detailed reasons i've done my research this is why i'm doing this is this is why i'm doing that and you go away and make your own decision i think that's that's good i would encourage that it's when someone just puts a tweet out and says uh tesla shares are too low or bitcoin's too low or whatever it may be that's the danger when they don't back it up and and look i i'm, I'm way too old to understand the influenza world but there is no such thing as a free lunch so if they do if they're sharing something what what's in it for them and you know, are they making money through it being a sponsor of content or are they have they got that stock that they're wanting to ride to the moon and kind of drive the price up so i think just be wary but but i think it is a bit of an industry issue i think as an industry we have started but we're nowhere near kind of demystifying the world of, of investment and thinking about long term but i think there's a much bigger issue here around kind of education and starting to teach kids at school what how money works uh, you know how an int you know, and, and you don't have to talk about investments at that stage. But, you know, saving. You know how interest rates work, uh, mortgages. All of these things. I think we start talking about these at at school level. I think that will start setting the long term vision that people need to have when it comes to finance. Great, I, Mark. I think we should move on to our penny for your thoughts section. Okay, uh, my uh, 2019 exchange traded fund passive portfolio was up 33. percent Very good. 2019. So but, 2019. Now we want from April. Uh, 19 to April 20. I do you? Yeah, thanks well, for you getting did. the wrong information. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll do that another week. Let's do the penny for your thoughts. Okay, so uh, Rohit, what's the best advice you've ever been given about money? So two, I'm going to say. One is, it, if it sounds to be good, if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. And I, and, and I use that all, all the time. And the second one is pension, pension, pension. Just keep saving into your pension. Great. Mark? Um, who do you bank with? So I bank with HSBC. Uh, when, when I landed in the UK to study when I was 18, they were the only bank that would allow me to open an account with having just moved to the country. So I've been with them for 20 years as a result of that. Very good. That's because they don't mind sort of money laundering and fraud. 
Oh, painful. <laughs> no, wow, HSBC, we're not available for comment. Thank no, you. I'm only teasing. I'm only teasing. <laughs> so, Ro- Rohit, are you a saver or a spender? Uh, I'm probably a bit of a saver, um, and, 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 and that comes to me, it comes more because I'm quite tight with money. So, if I'm going to spend it, I'll, I'll spend quite a lot of time researching how to get a better price. Better saver. And cash or card? Guys, do we still need to ask this question? Card, completely, without a doubt. Okay. What type of uh, protection do you have in place? Uh, so I've got uh, life insurance and critical illness insurance. Um, and, but, but I'll be honest, I only took that out when I had kids. Uh, and, and even though I'm in the industry, I didn't really understand the protection side of things. And that's where kind of seeing a financial advisor helps. Just kind of putting it in context and thinking about the long term and, and planning for your kids. So no income protection? No. Maybe we'll have a chat afterwards about that one. Okay. Um, pension or property? Pension. Uh, I, I mean, I own the property I live in, but that's about it. I, 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 you know, I think you, to, to buy a property and run it as a portfolio, I think it requires a lot of skill and a lot of capital, which I don't have, whereas pension is, is a bit of a no-brainer. So what's your money weakness? What do you waste your money on? Food. So my wife and I are a big, big foodies. We've got a long list of places we, we want to go to. We'll often choose our holidays based on, on restaurants. Um, oh, so you've had a holiday in McDonald's Watford? Oh, yeah. No, that's, <laughs> that's where I saw you, John. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so what's your favourite type of food? Um, anything that's a bit different. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you take Indian food and you twist it, that, that's quite interesting. You take Japanese food and mix it with Mexican, that's quite interesting. Uh, so anything that's a little bit different. Uh, so like a sushi okay. taco. Yeah, go, go, you, should, you should check out Sushi Samba. He's yeah, it's good there. I've been there, yeah. yeah. Above your office, isn't it? Uh, across the road from our office. Across Although the I road. Been, I haven't been into our offices yet because I joined uh, Omnis uh, during lockdown. Mm. Um, what would you do if you won the lottery? Well, first I'd go on holiday. Um, obviously, if it's you your can. place with, with a good restaurant. Um, yeah. Probably says a lot about how desperate I am to get away. And then I, I, I would really love to set something up that starts educating kids about money. Like, I think that's, that's the big gap in kind of, kind of for, for our industry and for, for, for the population as a whole. And I'd love to be thinking about that. Maybe there's an opportunity there for Omnis. Believe me, I'm looking into it. Fantastic. Well, keep me, keep me in the loop with that. It'd be great to be involved. Absolutely. Um, so if anyone wants to get in touch with you, Rohit, what's the best way? Where can they find out a bit more about you or contact you? Uh, so LinkedIn is probably the best place um, and, and we post a lot of content through, through Omnis on, on LinkedIn as well in terms of uh, the sorts of things we've just discussed now around active passive and, and how we monitor funds etc. So, so LinkedIn is probably the best place. I've got an Instagram account but it's just full of kids photos so I probably suggest not, not, not going down that Your way. own kids. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> my own kids. Yeah, like, disclaimer, my own kids. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time, Rohit. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.